Thank you, thank you. Thanks uh, so much for having me here. It, it is great to be back in Little Rock. I'm sure as you hear me talk, you can probably guess I am indeed not from the South. I'm originally from Portland, Maine. Um, but let me say a couple words about Denver, uh, which is he really did not do justice to what he did on the 2000 campaign. Uh, Denver was what we called the press wrangler. Uh, and what that effectively meant is that on a day in and day out basis, Denver was really responsible for managing the National Press Corps that was traveling with the Gore campaign. And to sort of put that into terms that I think most people would understand, it's a little bit like juggling live hand grenades on an everyday basis. And, that's, and, 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 and Denver did it with grace, with aplomb, uh, and even with some flair. Uh, but really, sort of the most important thing that Denver did for me personally is, you know, on these campaigns, you tend to have all sorts of consultants and experts and advisors. Um, and, you know, I would be in these meetings and sometimes people would have ideas and you know, they just wouldn't sound quite right, like they wouldn't necessarily play in Little Rock. Um, and so I'd go to Denver and I'd say, what do you think about this or what do you think about that? And, you know, almost every single time his gut reaction, his instinctive reaction, which is based on good common sense, was always right. So he was an enormously influential and informative sounding board for me during that campaign. Uh, and, you know, I call him, he was a younger Denver then, but he still is a young Denver now, so it's great to see him. And sitting next to him is, 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 is another good friend, um, the dean. Um, and, and the dean and I first met when uh, we were doing the equivalent, I'll use my military analogy again, of latrine duty in a campaign, uh, which is we did a bus tour together through northern Maine. Um, and, 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 and the dean, Skip Rutherford, is one of those guys who, when you're in the foxhole, you want him there with you. Um, he is someone who's enormously loyal, someone who's been a friend really since that time that we met. Uh, and one of the treats when I come back to Little Rock is really to see Dean Rutherford. So thank you for co-sponsoring this. I um, also want to thank uh, Nikolai, not sure where he is, uh, but he's somewhere out there. Nikolai is, you know, helps run the school and he showed me some real, I wouldn't even call it Southern hospitality, it's really Little Rock, Arkansas hospitality, which is he met me at the airport last night at 11, uh, which really does sort of reflect on, on, on the type of culture that exists here. And the program that you guys have put together at the school really is amazing. I went to law school at a small little school uh, in, in Boston, um, and they had a place there called the Kennedy School, which has speakers all the time. I would say that you take a look at the program that this school is putting forth day in and day out, it actually overshadows anything that's taking place out there. It's an incredible program, and you guys should be enormously proud of what you've put together here. It's really, really cool. Uh, and then Greg, thank you, and Karen, thank you for, for, for hosting me and sponsoring this. We had a good chat about, uh, I was able to show a little bona fides in terms of my knowledge of Arkansas basketball, uh, going back to the Sidney Moncrief era, and found out that Greg actually competed in that time period and was a state champion, so, so thank you so much for having me. <coughs> um, <laughs> So I do, have, I, I do feel I have an obligation whenever I am in, uh, in an Arkansas crowd, and I realize that this is a bipartisan crowd, uh, but to at least tell my story a little bit, uh, my Clinton story about how I got involved in, in the 91, 92 campaign, and, and then I'll get into the, the book, but I'll, I'll tell this brief story, which is summer of 1991, I'm in my early 20s, with then Governor Bill Clinton, who I knew a little bit about, you know, primarily from a speech that he'd given at the 1988 convention in Atlanta, is coming up for a picnic up in New England. Uh, and this is a time period before anyone had really announced, but he was obviously thinking about it. And you know, typical of then Governor Clinton, he arrived an hour late and stayed an hour longer. Uh, and you know, he met everyone, talked with everyone, you know, by the end, knew everyone's name, knew their parents' name, knew their dog's name, he knew everything about them, right? And as, as, as he's leaving, he grabs me and he says, are you with me? Right? Keep in mind, I'm 22, 23. I couldn't even get a date at that point, right? <laughs> Never mind having someone who's, running for, who's gonna potentially run for president asking me if I'm with them. And at that time, I had actually already signed up to work for uh, the governor of New York, Governor Mario Cuomo, uh, who I knew through family connections. Um, you fast forward to the fall of, of 91. Um, on the last day that you could register to be in the New Hampshire primary, Governor Cuomo's plane does not fly from Albany and he obviously makes the decision not to run. That night, somehow, the Clinton campaign tracked me down in my law school dorm room. Uh, you know, this is pre-cell phones, right? So I'm not even sure how they got the number. And they called and said, on such and such a date, you told Governor Clinton that if Governor Cuomo didn't run, you'd be with him. Uh, and so we're following up on that. 
And so immediately it goes through my head, you know, either A, this is one of the greatest political talents that the country has ever seen to have been able to find me in this dorm room at this time, or B, they have no one working for them, in which case I'm going to get a great title. <clears throat> of course, it ended up being the former, which is <laughs> a tremendous political talent, and to sort of reinforce that, my first job uh, for the campaign um, in New Hampshire was showing folks from Arkansas about how to put lawn signs in the ground in New Hampshire after the first frost. So that tells you the, where, where I fell in the campaign. Um, so I, I'm here today to talk a bit about the book that, that I co-wrote called Masters of Disaster. It's based on a class that I teach at, at the Stanford Business School on crisis management, uh, crisis communications, obviously informed uh, by my professional experiences. Uh, and it sort of deals with three subjects, and I'll touch on each of them you know, relatively briefly because it would be good to get some questions in Q&A here. Uh, but first, it looks at the relationship between crisis and trust. You know, it's my belief that we live in an era where, where trust is really under assault in, 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 in unique and different ways. Secondly, it looks at the fact that we live in an environment where uh, if you're not in a crisis, you're going to be in a climate of crisis almost on a continuing basis. Any you know, review of the papers and, and media on a daily basis reflect that. And then third, what can you do to, to survive? Um, so let me take each of those in turn and, and then, as I said, get into some Q&A. Uh, first, you know, what is a crisis, right? It's, it's a little bit like the old Ronald Reagan line, uh, which is when your neighbor loses a job, it's a recession. When you lose a job, it's a depression, right? For a crisis, when your neighbor, when people are questioning your neighbor and not trusting him or her, it's a scandal. When people are not trusting you, it's a crisis. Uh, and at the end of the day, the real issue is trust. And in particular, whether you, your business, your organization, your entity are trustworthy to that specific audience that will determine whether you're successful or not, whether you're viable or not, whether you can move forward or not. If you're a public company, shareholders. If you're a public official running for office, swing voters. Um, if you're a restaurant, the patrons of your restaurant. So at the end of the day, it's that specific question of do, does your core audience trust you or not? Has there been a reason for them to raise questions about whether you're trustworthy or not? Right? And this is all taking place you know, in the context of a society where trust is at historically low levels. You look at vir virtually every sector, religion, the media, business, government, sports figures. At every single one of those, based on the public data that's out there, trust is at historically low levels. And so you know, I usually begin my, my Stanford Business School class the very first day. I take a page out of that old the movie, the, uh, uh, the Paper Chase where the, the law professor walks in and says, look to your left and look to your right. You know, one of you are not going to graduate. I walk into my class and I say, look to your left, look to your right, look in the mirror. All three of you are going to face a crisis at some point. It's not a question of if, it's only a question of when. And then the real issue is, are you able to handle it? And in my view, there's basically five elements out there that you know, really contribute to why we live in this era or this where we're, era where crisis is basically a state of nature. And I'll tick through those you know, fairly quickly. The first is the proliferation of outlets. Right? You have 500 plus outlets on cable TV. You have trade publications. You have the traditional media. You have microblogs. You have tweets. Right? You have all this, these outlets out there. And what that means is that it's no longer a question of whether a tree falls in the forest and whether it's going to get covered or not. If a leaf even thinks it may fall, it gets covered. Right? And, you know, and, and, I had a conversation uh, a couple weeks ago with a Silicon Valley executive of a very big, large, well-known company. This executive told me that in 2012 alone, more information was communicated around the world than an entire time period of humanity added up up until that year. So in 2012 alone, more information was communicated, and this executive told me in 2013 will surpass 2012. So that just tells you the volume of information that's out there. Consider what happened in, in the Arab Spring you know, a couple years ago, which is for decades, authoritarian, totalitarian governments had suppressed information from getting out there. Uh, but because of the power of tweets, uh, information really got out there. And you really had a moment where a 140-word char character tweet was more powerful than an AK-47. That's because information gets out there, people can access it. Secondly, the speed in which information moves. Uh, I remember, and, and Skip will remember this, in the, uh, in the 1992 Clinton campaign, one of the insights of that campaign was the rapid response to the war room. 
And the premise then was that there were three news cycles a day. And if you could dominate those three news cycles, you would effectively impose your will on the campaign, impact the direction of the campaign, be in a position to win. Well, if you think about three news cycles today, it almost be the equivalent of taking a Model T and putting it into the Daytona 500, right? I mean, m you now have a, just a continuous media cycle. You have cycles within cycles, almost like the little wheels on the clock turning the bigger wheels. And you know, Marshall McClellan, who was a communications theorist, had talked in the 50s and 60s about you know, a global village, meaning that there would be information that everyone could share. Well, you now have a global village that is on speed, and the speed can kill. Um, another example, think of when bin Laden you know, was killed by the Navy SEALs uh, in Pakistan. That information was first reported almost moments after it happened via Twitter around the world. It was several hours before it was actually officially and formally announced, but the information was moving around the world instantaneously. So you have the, the speed in which information travels. The third element is what I call the opt-in, opt-out world, right? which is we now live in a society where you can specifically pick where you get information from, who you listen to, who you trust. You can get up in the morning, you can turn on MSNBC and Fox, two very different views of the world. You can get in your car, listen to your iTunes with the music that you pick, not necessarily a radio station. You go to a place that you've chosen to work. You go home to a community or a neighborhood that probably reflects your values, your philosophy, your ideology a little bit. Um, and so in this MSNBC versus Fox red-blue world, you have people getting very different pieces of communication um, uh, uh, than, than necessarily one big shared uh, sort of center of communication. Uh, you know, one way to look at this, uh, I was looking at some of the um, election data. You look at 1976, and the vast majority of the country, over 75% of the country in that presidential election, lived in a voting precinct, not a community, not a town, but the actual precinct where they voted that reflected the general election vote. And that was about a one-point election in, in, in the Ford-Carter race. You look at 2000, you look at 2004, you look at 2012, 2008 is a bit of an outlier, and you look at the election results, and more than half of the country, despite the fact that each of those elections were half a point to two-point elections, more than half the country lives in precincts that were landslide precincts. And it just tells you how we now live in a type of country where people really do sort of self-select where they live, where they get information with, who they interact with. Um, and look, you just have to watch the conversation that's taking place right now in Washington, D.C. over some of the fiscal choices we need to make as a country. And you have one view that's expressed on Fox, one view that's expressed on MSNBC. And depending on which one you're watching, they're completely different worlds. Uh, so that's the third element. Fourth element is the community nature of information, right? People can create information, share information, pass that information along in ways that we had never seen before. In, in California, when I was first started doing politics, we used to talk about a political rally in California being a family watching a commercial on their television set, right? That's not the case anymore. People actually can share information. Um, there are more eyeballs on, a, on Twitter than there are in the Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal combined. Um, you think about this last presidential election, arguably the defining moment in the election, some say what this election potentially turned on, was a two and a half minute video that was taken on a PDA, on a device, iPhone or a Blackberry, uh, by someone who may have been a bartender, may have been a waiter, you know, at a Mitt Romney fundraiser in the spring that gets put online and that no one really discovers until the fall, you know, which is the infamous 47% line. That becomes the defining moment of that campaign, and that was completely created by someone whose name we don't know and may never know. Uh, and then it was shared instantaneously. The fifth element uh, that, that I would identify is what I call the enormous negative feedback loop that currently exists in society, which is you have a cynical press reporting to a skeptical public in a time period where there are none of the historic gatekeepers that used to exist, right? When, when I was growing up and you know, there are people like Walter Cronkite who would come on and people would listen. He would sort of set the stage. There are major newspapers that would set the stage. Um, those don't exist to the degree that they used to. There's no real umpires out there calling the balls and strikes uh, for the public. Uh, and what that then creates is this, because of the other el elements that I've touched on, this big negative feedback loop which creates cynicism, skepticism, and ultimately high levels of distrust. I have clients who come to me and say, I, you know, I'm a corporation, I want to engage the public. I'm going to start talking to them via Twitter. 
And I point out that if you actually do that, you have to be aware that almost over 80% of the comments on Twitter are negative, right? So if you're gonna actually go out there and engage, you're gonna be engaging into that negative loop that, that I'm talking about. And you know, a, a good example of, of, of someone who really stumbled into that was Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods made an enormous mistake, uh, I think very much aware of what he did, but he ended up being on the front page of the New York tabloid, the New York Post, which is called The Wood in New York, 30 days in a row. He was on the front page more times than 9-11 was. And at some level, it was because there was this huge negative feedback loop with all this information being pushed out there. So you take all of those elements together, the, the, the proliferation of outlets, the speed in which information moves, this opt-in, opt-out dynamic, um, the fact that people can create information and share it in ways we've never seen before, uh, the negative feedback loop, all of that creates really a toxic environment for someone to be operating in, whether you're a company, an organization, a political candidate. Again, it's not gonna be a question of, of if, it's gonna be a question of when you have to deal with an issue. Um, and you know, that could be at any number of levels, right? It could be an Enron or a BP. It could be a high school principal who has a cheating scandal that suddenly is big news. It could be the barber shop at the corner that suddenly has three or four bad Yelp reviews. All of those things ultimately challenge the survivability of those particular entities. It could be the guy or woman in the cubicle who inadvertently hits reply all, right? On the message talking about his or her boss. That's a big crisis in that person's life. Um, so how do you survive in, in, in that type of a situation? Really, that you know, in the book we talk about the, the three operating principles or three principles of, of survival. Uh, the first is do no harm. It's like the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take, right? You have a patient, make sure you don't do anything to make their health worse. If you find yourself in a crisis and you're in a hole, the first thing you should do is drop the shovel, right? Don't call the backhoe in. Um, the you know, old proverb, right, it's the, crime, it's the cover up, not the crime, you know, is almost always the case so often in these situations. Right? Because people understand that you're gonna make mistakes. People understand that humans are fallible, that they have flaws, that something's gonna happen. What they wanna ultimately know, are you trustworthy? Can you be trusted going forward? And they extrapolate an awful lot by how you conduct yourself on the other side you know, of the issue, on the other side, the scandal. So, when, when, don't chase the press, right? If the press are trying to do stories and you're not in a position where you can actually give them information, better to get pounded for a couple days rather than putting out information that may not be tenable. Be accountable. You have to be willing to take some accountability and responsibility for your actions. Uh, think long term, right? This is not something that's gonna take care of itself in a very short order. This is something that you really have to think long term about how you're gonna handle it. So that's, that, that, that's survival principle uh, number one. And, you know, a good example of that, uh, you know, you really saw uh, in, in the two scandals of Anthony Weiner, folks remember, who's the congressman from, uh, from New York who uh, sent around photos of himself, uh, or at least parts of himself, uh, on Twitter, right? And then went through a week's worth of time where he basically denied it was him, even though it was clearly him, uh, and ultimately, you know, was forced to uh, revealed that in fact it, it was him. And he took a situation that, that while highly embarrassing, uh, and while certainly it would have been fodder for late night comedy for a week, and while certainly it would have been part of his story going forward, he created a situation because he lied about it, that he was unable to remain in office uh, because people were judging him by how he was handling it going forward. You compare that to a, uh, a David Petraeus, the general, right? He obviously had a situation uh, involving having uh, an affair with someone who was not, obviously not his spouse. Uh, he handled it, give it, again, not, not, not dismissing the conduct, but in terms of how he actually handled that moment, he handled it the right way. He went out, he took responsibility, he said he was accountable, he apologized, he resigned, and then he shut up, right? He now puts himself in a position where his comeback is gonna be a lot shorter than Anthony Weiner's. You know, within a year, he's gonna be teaching, he's gonna be on television, he's gonna have a book, uh, and shortly thereafter, people are gonna actually have basically forgotten why he actually left in the first place. Good example of how to do it, how not to do it when it comes to uh, making sure you don't dig yourself a deeper hole. Uh, principle number two, you have to have discipline, right? You have to realize, you, it's the old Michael Corleone line in The Godfather, right? It's business, don't take it personally. Um, that's how you have to envision this when, when you're in the middle of it. Uh, that you have to have a long-term plan, you have to be very disciplined, don't get lost in the fog of a crisis. I can't tell you, how many times I have walked into a client situation uh, where they had a plan on the shelf, uh, 
They had a war room that looked very nice, uh, but there was no functionality in terms of the actual decision making uh, within the organization. Uh, and so you actually have to have the absolute discipline to make the right kind of decisions. Um, and you know, two examples, or, or at least a good example of, of someone who did this the right way uh, was Apple. Apple, uh, midway through last year, had a series of, of articles, major articles in the New York Times talking about supplies and how, it was, how they were developed uh, using uh, uh, labor in China that raised all sorts of questions and ethical questions about the nature of their workforce and their subcontractors. But Apple didn't panic. They took their time. They actually went out. They retained an outside expert group to come and do uh, its own investigation. That group then, several months later, released a report. Apple adopted the report, embraced the report, and was really able to put the issue behind it uh, in ways that really mitigated some of the damage that it otherwise could have incurred. So that's principle number two. Uh, principle num number three is credibility, right? If your North Star is to get people to trust you again or to think that you're going to be trustworthy going forward, the way to get there, the path to get there is by being credible. Uh, and that means that every single thing that you do, every single thing that you say, every single action that you take has to be through the prism of is this accurate? Are we 110% sure it is accurate? If we're not sure it's accurate, you cannot put that information out, even if in the short term you think you're going to get some bad press or some bad coverage. Ultimately, people are eva evaluating you long term. Um, so think about how you put the information out, right? You often are in a position to control the flow of information. You can put it out under your own terms. Get it together, put it out, do it in a smart way. You can control expectations. You can tell people, next Monday, I'm going to release this information. And that next Monday, you release the information. By creating that expectation, you're actually creating some of your own credibility points going forward. And so if you take those three principles, the fact that you need to be, uh, don't dig yourself a, dig, a, a deeper hole, uh, the fact that you need to be disciplined, and the fact that you need to maintain your credibility at all costs, those are really the three principles of being able to survive a crisis in the current era that we live in. Uh, and the very short way to characterize it, or really short way to describe it that, that I often use is it's basically telling the truth the right way. And so if there's one lesson to take away from the conversation that, that we're having is that it's likely that you're going to face a challenge or the organization you're with is going to face a challenge at some point. And at that point, the test will be, can you tell the truth the right way in a way that helps build trust going forward with that key audience that's going to make or break whether you're successful or not, and if you can do that, and I think these principles will help you, you'll be in a position to survive going forward. So with that, I'd like to open it up to some questions. It's, it's a great question, and it's, it's funny. I, as I mentioned, I, I teach a class at, at, at a business school, and I know many folks in here are business people, but the business crowd tends to be very linear in their thinking, right? They, they, they keep asking the question, when is that moment? Well, just tell me when I'm supposed to put it out or when I'm not supposed to put it out. The reality is, is that this is a bit of what you call a soft science, right? Um, and what I advise my clients, what I advise students, is that you need to do a cost-benefit analysis. And that cost-benefit analysis is pretty simple. And it's as follows, which is if you do not put the information out and it comes out from some other person or some other entity, are you going to be able to survive that? Versus if you put this information out on your own terms in a way that's going to build credibility, in a way that's going to build trust going forward, are you going to be stronger than the other alternative? And that really sort of drives the when, the if, and, and at some level, the how. Um, and then the second part of that analysis is, OK, if we make the decision that we do need to put that information out because it does go to our ability to succeed and to survive, who is it that we're ultimately talking to? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, is it a shareholder because you're a public company? Uh, is it a swing voter? Is it you know, your patrons at a restaurant? Uh, and that answer will ultimately drive where you put it out. Right? There could be a publication that is particularly impactful to your audience, I, I had a, it's in the book, but I had a client, um, uh, it's called New Vision, and they were a publicly traded company that owned about 20 local TV broadcast channels across the country. 
And when the economy collapsed in 2008, they had to go through a bankruptcy process. And they knew that they had about you know, a handful of really key significant shareholders, institutional investors. Uh, but they were concerned, just given the way the analysts would cover the company, that going through a bankruptcy proceeding you know, would potentially be interpreted by analysts in a way that they didn't think would actually accurately reflect what they were doing. And so what we did is we created a Twitter account, went to each of the uh, major shareholders, all the shareholders, and told them that you could get information directly about all the filings by signing up for this Twitter account. And that allowed the company to really circumvent having to go through the traditional analyst press to be able to get their message directly to the people that they really cared about. If the shareholders stuck with them, uh, they were in good shape. If people decided that they wanted to pursue litigation and challenge the bankruptcy, they were going to have a bigger challenge. Um, I just use that as an example of they, made it, they had to go forward, right? But they identified the specific way to be able to effectively communicate with those core audiences that were going to make or break them. Uh, well, I think Denver alluded to it in, the, in his earlier comments. Uh, uh, obviously, I was you know, in the uh, Clinton White House uh, through the through eight years of the Clinton presidency. Um, and uh, you know, the issues that we faced there, you know, uh, obviously, were at a different level than the typical issues that you face. I deal with an awful lot of big issues, um, uh, representing some of the biggest companies in the country, some of the biggest public figures in the country on a regular basis, stuff that you read about all the time. But you know, nothing necessarily compares to, you know, at some level when the presidency of the United States is at some level at stake. Yes, back there. Well, look, I think we had a discussion earlier today uh, with Denver, uh, which I think gets, uh, we had a discussion which gets, I think, directly at that question, which is, you know, while we live in a time period where you're going to be exposed to crisis and challenges in ways that you typically had not been in the past, you also now have a time period where there are enormous levers to put information out there. Um, both online and through other types of, of means. And so you know, one of the advantages that you have, or at least one of the tools that you have available to you in this day and age is that you have a lot more ways to be able to effectively communicate. Look, I am ultimately very much of an optimist about this country and about where we're going. I think right now in the current time period that we're in, some of the social media tools you know, have not necessarily progressed enough. I think ultimately they're going to be usually impactful in terms of really supporting a robust democracy. People can really use those tools, government can use those tools to really change how people interact with their democracy. And it's a little bit like going back to where we were in the pre-electronic age, right? Before there was television and radio, politics was much more of an interactive process. Uh, then you had the advent of radio, advent of TV, and politics became much more of a passive process. People would spend a lot of money on ads and you would sit there and receive the ads and they would try to impact your decision making. Now because of social media and some of the other tools that exist out there, which by the way are only going to increase as we move forward, there are more levers being put out there that I think will actually be great for democracy going forward in terms of people's ability to engage, interact, and be involved.
Yeah, it's a great question, and that's often a very hard conversation to have because for, for two reasons. First of all, most people have been brought up in a non-crisis environment that have been taught that you need to respond as quickly as possible, which is often the wrong thing to do in a crisis. Uh, and so often we have to have you know, very hard conversations over the idea that, look, if you respond now, it is more likely than not you're going to make a mistake and dig yourself a deeper hole, create a bigger problem. You're playing the longer term game here. And then what we often do is we'll show them some really specific examples uh, of folks you know, who would be comparable to whatever space they're in, who did it the right way and who did it the wrong way, and where they ultimately ended up. And that tends to disabuse people you know, of, of, their, uh, of their instinct to try to respond quickly. But it's, it's human nature, right? And, and you see it all the time. Uh, at some level, it's helped, keeps me in business, frankly, which is that you know, someone will be under pressure. They'll insist they haven't done anything wrong. They'll go out there and put information out. And then pretty quickly, that information is not sustainable or tenable, and they find themselves in a much bigger problem than they would have faced otherwise. So what we really do is we do show people really specific examples, uh, and that tends to, to be a pretty sobering, you know, sobering uh, process. Okay, I'm sorry. And that's an interesting question. Um, uh, without using uh, any specific names for obvious reasons, um, uh, I and, and you may be able to guess who this is, but I will I will I will leave it uh, general. Um, there have been folks who uh, made a decision to go on a particular program to discuss their particular situation um, when both the program didn't make sense, sort of the time and the news cycle didn't make sense. Um, and they didn't have their facts together. They weren't prepared to be able to deal with the types of questions that they were going to get. Um, and you know, they ended up creating far bigger exposure for themselves uh, than they would have uh, just by not doing the interview and, 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 and being quiet. And you know, the other one that we often run into um, is a fight, and I'm, I say this as a lawyer, is you know, oftentimes a fight with lawyers. Uh, which is, uh, you know, lawyers off some lawyers, and this is a general generalization and probably not fair, but there is a certain instinct amongst a lot of lawyers, you know, to try to win the legal fight, you know, while potentially losing the larger public war, uh, particularly on perception, uh, and that's often a fight that that we have. Um, you know, there's the great example, and it's 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 a bit of an extreme, but of Arthur Anderson. You know, Arthur Anderson was the accounting firm was being investigated by the Justice Department. Uh, for uh, its advice that it had given to Enron on accounting issues. And you know, the lawyers for Arthur Anderson decided to, that they really wanted to fight the Justice Department, and the Justice Department's response was, okay, we'll indict you. And if you're a public accounting firm, once you're indicted, you by definition have to go out of business, right? Four or five years later, you know, the counsel for Arthur Anderson actually won their case at the Supreme Court, but the 120,000 people who worked for Arthur Anderson no longer had a job. The company no longer existed. Uh, again, that's an extreme example, but, but the other analog I, I point you to is there's a company in Canada called McCain Food. And McCain had a situation, sort of the Tyson Food, I guess, is the easiest way to describe it, of, of Canada. And they had a situation where the CEO became aware that there was a listeria issue with some of their food that was actually killing some folks, but this wasn't public. Uh, and you know, he chose, against the explicit advice of his legal counsel, to do effectively the full Monty. Went out there. Did a press conference, announced it, said that you know, it didn't really matter what was going to happen to his company. It was more important to make sure that we did everything possible to make sure that the public health was protected, and really went to some pretty extreme lengths to the level where I believe they actually made TV ads warning people you know, not to eat their food and to return it, and that they would be uh, refunded. I mean, you know, a pretty extreme approach. Uh, and you know, the company took a big hit initially, but you know, within a year, uh, it was back and above where it had been prior to the incident, and the CEO of the company was actually named like the Canadian Man of the Year uh, for how he approached it. Um, again, a, a fairly extreme example, but he did take great relish in pointing out at almost every single opportunity. I did this despite the fact the lawyers told me not to. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, again, I say this as a lawyer, but, but I do, that, that's an area where you often have some real tensions and you really have to think it through.
Sure. I, I, I think the question. Yeah, I, I believe I, the comment on the, uh, on the situation in Florida during the 2000 presidential campaign, is that right? Yeah, well, as I, I, I like to point out, I was responsible for the popular vote and not the Electoral College. <laughs> Denver was working with me on the popular vote as well. So, um, I mean, look, it's a, uh, obviously, it's, uh, it was a very strange experience to go through, uh, particularly as someone who was so closely associated with, with, with the Gore campaign, um, to actually have won an election defined as having gotten more votes than the other person, but not actually to have been sworn in. Um, and you know, it was a really interesting time period, and I'll just sort of touch on a couple of things. First of all, I, I don't think a day still goes by where you don't think about it at least once. Um, again, I'm, my, some of my biases are gonna come out here. I think the country would have been in a very different place had results been different. Um, and it's hard for me not to think about that and see that you know, manifested in any number of ways. Um, I do think that, and you know, this, was a, this has been in books, so I'm not saying anything you know, that I haven't said before. Um, and Denver, I'm sure, remembers some of this, but you know, the night, really, the morning after the election, uh, you know, the campaign, the Gore campaign, was really trying to figure out you know, what the public narrative should be, how we should be discussing this. And you know, it made a decision, uh, and again, I'm not saying anything that hasn't been written about in books, a decision that I disagreed with to focus explicitly on trying to get recounts in a couple of counties in Florida, you know, as opposed to asking for just an entire statewide recount. Uh, and I think if you go back and you look at that, that was probably a decisive moment uh, because at that point in time, I think we lost the, or at least we, we, we ceded a bit of the moral high ground that the campaign otherwise would have had. Uh, and that, I think, greatly impacted some of the public perceptions that sort of played out from there. And so when I go back and look at that, you know, that is a moment in time where I think just from a pure sort of crisis communications perspective, uh, you know, did we really think through what should have been the right message? Who were we talking to? Uh, because it, uh, you ended up in a situation where it almost looked like both campaigns were trying to game out where they could get the most votes from, as opposed to getting to where it should have been, which is let's actually figure out who won Florida. Yeah, great question. Um, uh, uh, commandments 9 and Commandments 10 in the book, and I did not go through every single commandment because it would take too long, um, actually deal specifically with those two issues, right? In many situations, you will have people who have their own agenda. Uh, and we talk about the fact that no one should be able to get free layups, right? There's Pat Riley, the former LA Laker, New York Knicks, Miami Heat coach, had a rule, no free layups. If you're going to go in for a layup, you're going to get hit. And you know, if someone has a specific agenda out there against you, you know, it's incumbent upon you, it's imperative upon you to make sure that is exposed. Now, your, your ability to expose it is a lot stronger if you've held yourself accountable and if you've done certain things to be open and transparent so that people are then willing to listen to what you have to say. You know, if you haven't gotten yourself to that place, it gets harder to put out some of that information, but if you have, once you put that information out there, it begins to contextualize the situation. People begin to view what's being said in a different way. And sometimes, if you do it right, you can completely flip the tables. Uh, and suddenly, the people or entity that was really behind this is exposed, and they're the ones who are on the defensive. Um, but it absolutely has to be part of your program, you know, assuming that that exists. If you're in a situation, usually you are. I mean, if you're a business, there's competitors out there who are pushing stuff out there. If you're in politics, there's usually another candidate who's moving stuff around. Uh, it could even be a restaurant where there's another restaurant that's a competitor to yours. Um, but if there are folks who have unclean hands and are involved in it, it really is important to try to get that information out there. Maybe the last question. Sure, hands. Okay. You talked about the change and what you could do with the news cycle. Uh, how in the world has changed this? Do you recommend targeting? Yeah, it's a good, good, good question. The question is, you know, how do you sort of choose who you target from a media perspective? I mean, there's a couple of things, and touched on this a little, a little earlier as well, which is, you know, figuring out who your audience is and, and what outlets are going to impact them, making sure that you have the right message so that what they're hearing, you know, if you, if you know your core audience and you actually have the right message, 
and then making sure you find the right vehicle to get to them. Um, and that, just a, a quick example, again, without using you know, specific names, I represented uh, an energy company a while ago that had a situation where there was uh, an oil uh, explosion in a, in a pipeline. Um, and, and some folks had, had, had passed away as a result. And they went through a lengthy process with the federal government, state government, uh, where they ultimately got you know, to a settlement. Um, and the settlement number was actually smaller than the number that Wall Street had baked into their numbers. Uh, and you know, when they first contacted me, they had written this press release, which was like 15 pages in length. They went through you know, all sorts of explanations, you know, trying to explain why they were environmentally sensitive, why there's, right? And, and so we had a conversation and I said, look, with all due respect, at, at the end of the day, people are invested in your company because they want to make money. Uh, they did not invest in your company because of some of these other issues. And that's really who you are talking to, them and the analysts at some level. And you know, your 15 page press release should really be one sentence. We are pleased to put this issue behind us, here is the number, right? Because the number was smaller than people expected and what people wanted to know was that the whole situation was over and I recommended that instead of even going to a specific outlet, they just put it out on, on the PR Newswire, which is a source that goes to everyone sort of simultaneously uh, because that information to their core audience, in fact, was not bad news. As odd as this may sound, it was actually good news in terms of who they were really talking to. And so they did that, one sentence statement, you know, release. Uh, their price went up because the number was better than what people had baked into their stock. And you know, it ended up being reported. Again, I'm, I wanna be clear, very serious situation. People, I'm not, 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 not trying to you know, cast a positive light on the underlying facts, but in terms of how it was reported, it was basically reported as good news um, from a financial perspective. Uh, and so that was an example of figuring out what the message was and the best way to communicate it. Uh, but it really depends on, on the nature of the subject. If it's a big national story and you want to get out there in a big way, right? The New York Times really is, stands alone in this day and age uh, as being a very prominent outlet. But with social media, there's ways to do this so that you can control the information yourself. I have a client I was just talking to the other day. Uh, this client was agitated because there had been a story in a relatively mid modest sized newspaper. The client didn't like. This client has four million plus people on the client's Twitter feed, and you know, by a factor of like a multiplier of 100, more people are gonna read the five tweets this person sends out on a daily basis than are ever gonna read you know, a particular newspaper. And so you know, focus your time on actually talking to the people who you really care about in the best way possible to reach them. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you.